This week on Physio Foundations, I'm talking to Matt Pryor again, a sports and exercise physiotherapist and a lecturer at Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia. And if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and listen to that one first because I introduced Matt and we talk about his experience working as a physiotherapy educator in Flinders University and his experience working with runners with injuries in the clinic. It's a really interesting chat and we're going to build on those foundational concepts and the skills and knowledge that Matt was discussing in the first episode. And then in this episode, we're going to talk about Matt's experience working with athletes from different levels of competition in football or soccer, depending where you're from, and athletes with a physical disability. Okay, Matt, welcome back to Physio Foundations for part two of our chat. Thanks very much for joining me. No, thank you. So well, let's go straight back into it because listeners have heard last week's episode and you had an introduction from you and they know who you are. Let's not waste our time, go straight back into our chat about sports physio and I'm particularly interested in your experiences working with athletes from different levels of competition. So you've worked with adults, kids, um, elite athletes, um, individuals in a clinic, people who have come to see you with sports injuries, you've worked with uh, people with physical disabilities. Can you tell me a little bit about, first of all, how those opportunities came around for you and your experiences working in sport as a physio? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think with, with sports physio, it's interesting in that being, being involved in it at one stage kind of has a bit of a snowball effect and leads to more opportunities doing sports physio stuff where we sort of seen as being able to do that. So sort of more opportunities crop up over time. So for me, it started off actually when I was going through my undergraduate degree and studying physio, I uh, worked as a sports trainer um, for local soccer club. So did that for uh, a couple of years while I was studying, which um, I mean, certainly from a, a learning point of view was fantastic in that you sort of helped to, build your handling skills, you got to see things happen, really, really useful learning experience, but also to something that I really enjoyed. Um, I continued working there when I graduated um, as a physio and eventually got to working at a clinic here in Adelaide where um, one of the women's national team physios was working. And one year, the Paralympic soccer team, the Pararoos, um, had their national carnival or the state-based national carnival here in Adelaide. And at the end of it was a national team training camp. Um, and so the normal physio couldn't make it. And they asked um, a colleague of my boss at the clinic if she could cover that weekend. And she couldn't, but knew that I had an interest in soccer. So asked if I would be interested in doing it. And so I um, said, yeah, absolutely. Be really keen to to jump at that opportunity. So worked with them uh, over the weekend here in Adelaide. And then probably about six months later or so, then got a call that their normal physio wasn't available to go away um, with them for a tournament overseas. And because I'd worked with them in the last sort of six to 12 months, would I be interested in doing that? So you know, from there on in, you know, sort of one role tends to snowball into to different roles or at least gets you... I guess, mixing with and networking with people who may have other opportunities down the track. And that's sort of how, yeah, working in that role with the Paralympic team for a number of years then helped with a uh, opening up doors and communication to yeah, work with Adelaide United here in the A-League. Um, and then again, getting involved with the national team set up again with the, the Joeys more recently. When you work, when you graduate rather as a physiotherapist, you've almost got endless opportunities with the degree that you've got. but the jobs and the opportunities that you end up taking aren't necessarily advertised or obvious. Um, so did you have, did you really recognize that as an opportunity to move into, you know, working as a sports physio with teams or you sort of grabbed the bull by the horns and, and went with it at that stage, or did you sort of just go along with what was happening? And did you, did you think you sort of pushed it and were proactive or were you lucky in that regard? I, I think all of the above. And I think with what you mentioned around that those things aren't necessarily advertised or, or the like, mm. absolutely, absolutely. And I think that with working at the local soccer club at the very sort of start of the career, I, I definitely thought that that was, and working in that environment 
working with more sort of full-time professional clubs. That was something that I really loved to do, but knowing how to get there, how to sort of open those doors is a little bit more of a grey area, is a little bit more of an unknown. So part of it was wanting to, to try and go down that path, but another part of it was, yeah, I guess an element of luck and sort of being able to connect with and network with with the right people that have, you know, sort of kept you in mind for things down the track. Mm. And what about the work itself? So what, and you can answer this any way you like, it's just your experience that we're interested in here. So what are the differences in working, say, with adults at the recreational level or the elite sport level? And then, you know, compared to kids, you've worked with kids sport um, and adults with physical disabilities. How do those types of sporting populations differ in terms of your approach and, you know, your experiences? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. As I think the certainly in a more full-time or professional sporting setting, the big thing that, and, and certainly it took me a little bit of time to, to wrap my head around, was that what I might be saying as a physio in terms of how best to heal this injury or look after your body or things like that, in some cases that's secondary to the outcome for them of what happens on the weekend. You know, I, I just, you know, in a clinic, you might say, look, I don't think you should play or, um, you know, this is high risk. I don't think it's a good idea. And for the most part, you know, people might sort of take that on board. But I think that there's the prime objective for people at some very pointy ends of, of sport is that performance. And so oftentimes it's, a, it's not a trade-off, but a bit of informed decision-making on their part as to knowing that they might have this thing, this injury or the like, but can they still do what they do, do what they get paid to do um, and achieve success on the field? So that, that sort of took me a little bit of time to get my head around. Um, but for me, I think it's something that I've gotten more comfortable over time knowing that if I can communicate to them the pros, cons, benefits, risks of each approach, ultimately that decision is between them and the coach. And so long as I've made it really clear and they've got a really good understanding as to what the potential outcomes are of that. Um, yeah, I'm really comfortable with that. What are some of the um, challenges? So you worked with the Australian National Paralympic football team, the Pararoos, and um, what are some of the challenges unique to that type of physiotherapy practice that you found? Um, and perhaps some tips for people who might be going into that type of work for the first time. Yeah, oh, they, they were fantastic fantastic group to work with uh, probably some of my most enjoyable times uh, working in sport working with uh, working with the Pararoos and I think that the key thing that I was, or the, the thing that I sort of summarise it is that the sporting injuries or the injuries that they sustain playing football are exactly the same as you might see or expect to see in an able body population you know they sprain ankles tear quad muscles all of that sort of thing probably the the difference may be that there's some, I guess, greater consideration of some more medical um, things in their background. And I guess just by way of background information, the Pararoos are athletes predominantly with either cerebral palsy or acquired brain injury. But also too, whilst they have the same injuries as your able-bodied athletes, sometimes more your rehab is a little bit more... Um, troubleshooting in the sense that because of some of the physical impairments that they may present with, you may have to come up with a different way of doing your go-to exercise or the like um, around their impairment. And a really good example um, with one of my first trips with them was that uh, we had a guy who sprained his ankle quite significantly. And, you know, we might, with getting them back into training or playing, look to try and strap this ankle up as a bit of a preventative strategy. Um, but it was on his hemiplegic side and he normally walks in plantar flexion and inversion on his toes. So trying to strap his ankle into a more neutral position, whilst it might be really good for his ankle ligaments, means that he can't walk or move at all because it's sort of taking him away from his um, default strategy. Tricky. Um, yeah, exactly. So the injury, the pathology is the same, but there's sometimes a little bit more troubleshooting around how we're going to treat it and manage it. Um, same thing too for you might have someone with um, hand or finger deformity as a result of tone and you, know, you might get someone 
holding away from the gym normally for their exercise, how are we going to do this safely around this person's impairments and limitations? So that's the that's probably the main difference, but equally too, quite a quite a fun problem solving thing with these guys too. One of my overall aims with this, these discussions is to hopefully open up rather than having a musculoskeletal podcast, and there will be episodes that, that are focused on that, but you know, having people from all areas of physiotherapy practice on and sort of making the overall point that it isn't, it's rarely just one simple, you don't work in orthopedics, neurological or cardiothoracic. There is nearly always stuff going on from all the different fields. And that, that's a really good example of where you want broad skills broad knowledge as a physiotherapist that you can bring into that environment and help people. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I would in no way consider myself to be um, good at or expert in neurological stuff or, or the like there, but sort of going back to what we were saying before in the first half, that having that little bit of rotational background, broad experiences early in your career and knowledge that's where it sometimes comes back in handy where you don't use it every day you don't um you know you're not relying on it regularly but it's pretty handy to have in the back of your mind to be able to tap into on those occasions where yeah knowing a little bit about this stuff does cross over into the um the setting that you are working in yeah, i think that was one of the first questions in episode one the first um part of our chat wasn't it about whether you'd go into private practice first or go into a rotating position. So there's a really good argument for trying to broaden that experience yeah. early on before you um, niche down later. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. In the, and it also in the first chat, we started talking more about assessment and you talked about clinical decision-making or clinical reasoning, um, you know, those most fundamental knowledge and skills. And it was in a, a focus on assessment. And then I said, let's leave rehabilitation and um, interventions for the second part of the chat. Um, and we'll sort of talk about them in a sports context. So let's go there. Um, so we'll think about as a sports physio, um, and one of your interests is, is exercise in rehabilitation specifically. Um, so what are your tips for students or new grads or any practitioner of any level for that matter for using exercise effectively within a rehab setting or paradigm? I think the biggest tip or the biggest thing that certainly with working with students on their placements and the like that we sort of try and encourage them about with exercises that you're essentially with your rehab trying to prepare someone to be able to go back to what they want to be able to do, go back to the sport, whatever it might be. So we need to be able to have them prepared for and deal with the load that they're going to be exposed to doing what they're doing. Um, and so I often think sometimes we... Are re well, we're really good at giving body weight, TheraBand exercise, all that sort of stuff, but that may not be on a par with where it needs to be for that person to tolerate going back to you know, their soccer or their, their physical work or whatever it might be. You know, I remember um, many years ago there was a student where we had in the student clinic, um, and the great thing about the, the student clinic at Flinders is that it's when I went through and studied, it was all sort of GP referrals. It'd be a big, long wait list. And by the time that they'd sort of get onto your list, it was very much all almost chronic cases all the time. Whereas with the student clinic at the uni here, we've got much more, works like a private clinic where any, anything and everything can come in. And we had a, it's actually an ultra marathon runner come in looking for an injury prevention program because he's going to try and tackle an ultra marathon event later on in the year. And so the students started talking about, you know, wanted to try and build strength um, with him and the like because you know, evidence for injury prevention was like, fantastic. This is great. Um, and I think their initial thing was to give him, I think, two by 10 body weight calf raise and I think three by five single leg glute bridging and sort of having the discussion with them that, you know, this guy's running 120, 130 Ks a week. I'm not sure. 20 body weight calf raises is really going to give him anything more than his 120 Ks a week running so the load aspects i think is really important and making sure that the exercise your exercise prescription is on par with their needs and so rather than getting them to do something light more often getting someone to do something heavier more higher load less frequently you know sort of on a par with some of those resistance training strength training guidelines that's 
that's, I think, something that we can be doing, doing a bit better. And the student, I hope, had a really good clinical experience because you, you come across as an educator who's kind, which is one of those things that everyone acknowledges in, is important and not everyone does, especially on Twitter and places like that where you're anonymous. So, you know, you've said fantastic, you know, that's great, but, and, and then, then has, have progressed their you know, clinical reasoning about why they may need to load them up. And, and it was interesting you talked about just the first thing you said was um, trying to think about somebody's you know load tolerance and their capacity and where we need to get you with this exercise so thinking about the bigger picture in mind yeah. what about in football um so obviously in professional sport we've got a lot of people you can work with you've got exercise science you've got high performance um you've got the medical team the doctors and trainers so and coaches so where do you fit in in terms of because physiotherapists are trained and we do spend a lot of our time with acute injuries and we're quite good with the early rehab stage as you've acknowledged it's the progression to the higher end rehab particularly outside of an elite environment that's more difficult isn't it because you've you don't have as many people around to refer to and work with but is Absolutely. it easier or, or harder in, in a sense to to do that you know be a rehab exercise focused physio in an elite sports team how does it work yeah, it, it, it can work both ways. And I certainly think that, you know, time, times have changed. When I first started with, you know, local level teams, even with the, the power roos, you know, the, you weren't just a physio, you were the doctor, you were the s &C, you were the, the assistant kit manager dragging stuff off the bus there as well. It's like, you know, everything was sort of your purview. Whereas now with, and it's much better now, with better resourcing and the like and more experts in their field joining in, um, you get a lot more expert opinion. You get a lot more insight into how best we can be doing these things. But there's a lot of crossover between where someone's role might finish and another person's role in the process takes over. And I think that yeah, that that's where the the communication for me in, in sports um, I think is more important is that interprofessional. So I think yes, the communication is important with your athlete, your patient, but I think that knowing not professional boundaries, but the, the professional relationship and how you guys as a team from a support staff perspective are going, what are your processes for managing it? That's where I think communication becomes really important in that setting. Because I mm. think from a rehab, if we were just sort of planning rehab, um, yeah, I, I'm a bit of a nerd. I like spreadsheets and all that sort of stuff. I think yeah, that's the bit I, I really quite like where, you know, you've got an end goal of where you want this person to be, training and playing. You know where they're at acute, you know, they can't move, they can't walk because they've got their sprained ankle or whatever it might be. You know, managing them at either end of that spectrum, I think, is quite simple. It's more of a challenge and the grey bit is how to get them from point A to point B and what are the little mini steps along the way. Mm. Such good information, really good advice for, I guess, students, clinicians of any level, new grads in particular, but people who are thinking of going in that direction and um, in, in the same direction you've been in and working in elite sport. So let's finish off with another one of your passions. You said you admitted to being a nerd and that's not a bad thing. That's a, it's a, a compliment in disguise, that one, because um, we need to be backing up what we're doing with information and spreadsheets and that's great. So one of here's a nerdy topic evidence-based practice when one of your passions is evidence-based practice yourself as a clinician but also um, instilling those values and that, that work ethic to consult with the evidence with your students so how do you stay on top of new research evidence um, for your teaching and for your clinical work and do you have some strategies or tips you can share for staying on top of the evidence and also implementing the hmm. you know the evidence whenever you can yeah, well, um, we sort of talked about our shared interest before in running um, and I've also got a little bit of interest in hamstring stuff as well and it's going to sound incredibly nerdy, but having like a little bit of a, a monthly PubMed alert set up so there's anything new come out with a topic of hamstring or running injury, you, know, you get updates of those monthly. Yeah, that's a great um, tip. You've got to do that. Yeah, I mean, you're not you're never going to be able to read all of it, but there you know might be a, a title that sort of piques your interest from that. But I also find, you know, weirdly enough, Twitter to be quite useful from a keeping abreast of relevant um, new research. In that you know you might follow some key 
people, either researchers or physios working in a certain field, whether it be sports stuff, neuro stuff, cardio stuff, whatever it might be. Um, weirdly enough, Twitter seems to be an environment where, from a professional point of view, there is a lot of sharing of research and new stuff. So that's quite a nice way of, yeah, keeping abreast of new stuff and seeing what's out there that might pique your interest to, to look further into. Mm. And it's not only the conversations, but like you said, it's the sharing of new information. And so journal alerts and having a search strategy and having a regular you know, time when you look at the literature, um, contacting authors is a good one. Or if you're not working in a university or alumni association where you have access to the, the papers, just find the abstracts and yeah. contact authors, yeah. contact colleagues. It helps build your network as well. What about Absolutely. implementing new findings? So let's say there's a new clinical practice guideline or a change in practice that's coming out or even a change in the language that we're using to describe what we're doing. Um, how do you, what's your strategies for changing yourself and adapting to that? Yeah, I think you know, getting exposed to new stuff is really important. And you know, how I do things now is very different to sort of five or 10 years ago. But equally to, I think new stuff comes out really often, really regularly. And you as a clinician need to make a decision as to whether you think that is relevant, applicable and helpful to your practice. I think adopting something and changing how you do things just because it's new is not a good approach. Um, sort of change for change's sake, uh, you sort of need to, uh, you know, a bit like weekend courses or things like that too, you know, take on board as much new information as you can, but then you need to sort of make a, a reason call yourself as to whether, you know, do you understand it? Do you agree with it? Um, is it going to help in your setting? Um, because it's important with that evidence-based practice side of things that the the clinical part and the individual environment that you're working in, that is part of the consideration, the evidence-based practice. It's not purely the, the journal research stuff. It's also the applicability in that to the individual in front of you. So that's something where weighing up all of those different things will help you make a decision as to whether you want to be trialling it uh, in your practice. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've covered in the two episodes, we've covered your personal experiences in and your philosophies and approach to teaching and student experiences, your own experiences in sports physio and working with clients in the clinic. And, you know, we've, you've given us a whole bunch of really neat little tips and, and ideas to things to consider. Um, what we'll do is finish off there. And I'd really like to chat to you again, if you've got time on the podcast, perhaps we'll follow up in the future. And so I've got so many more questions but we're keeping the episodes to 20, 30 minutes each. So they're um, easy to consume. So we'll leave it there, but I'm sure that everyone wants to find out a little bit more about you and your work. So where can people follow you online and connect with you and go from yeah, there? Um, I'm oh, infrequently on social media, um, social media, on Twitter, and the likes sort of lurking to sort of find research articles we found before. It's more probably more for sharing memes and bad puns probably on my part, um, but can also get in touch uh, probably more about you know, what I'm doing work-wise like through our clinic website, clinic social media at Body Fit Physio in North Adelaide um, and also yeah, LinkedIn for professional stuff there as well. can continue the conversation online. Well, well, thanks very much, Matt. Really appreciate you coming on Physio Foundations for a chat and really looking forward to doing it again sometime. No, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.